Welcome. My name is Craig Peters, and I'm a product manager at JFrog. I'm here to talk to you about how you can work with OpenShift and uh, understand what a Kubernetes registry means. So first, just a couple of words about myself. You can follow me on the social media. You can follow me as an athlete, whatever you like. I'm a cyclist. Uh, that's what I love to do when I'm not playing with computers. Uh, when I am playing with computers, I spend a ton of time these days uh, building cloud native apps for Kubernetes and uh, playing with all of the different distributions of Kubernetes, most recently with OpenShift. So today I'm here to talk to you about a few things. First, I want to introduce you to who is JFrog as a company and, and why are we relevant in the space? Why, why would anybody care about what is JFrog? Then I'll talk about the notion of a Kubernetes registry and, and how that relates to package management. And lastly, I'll share a demo. We're going to do uh, a Node.js application. We're going to use the OpenShift S2I to build that and uh, use the capabilities of JFrog to detect issues in that application to block its build and deployment so that, uh, you know, so that you don't put unsafe apps into production in your environment. And that's what a Kubernetes registry can help you do. So first about JFrog, our vision is to enable uh, software organizations to ship their software safely and reliably to any kind of environment. So our target can be OpenShift, our target can be traditional application stacks, LAMP, uh, wh what have you. The reason we do that is that we believe that automating the build and delivery of software is what helps us go fast and go safe. The, we believe that uh, software updates should flow, and uh, we have a lot of evidence to show that a lot of people believe this as well. So we have a very large customer base. Uh, we have customers all across many, many industries, everything from uh, big internet and service providers all the way through engineering, research, aerospace, education, and so forth. So we've got a lot of uh, downloads. We have a big support of the open source community. So if you have an open source project, you can actually use uh, our software as a service. You can sign up uh, on our website. And so with that, let me get started explaining what it is that we are talking about when we talk about repository management. Well, repositories are the way that you manage the artifacts. The artifacts are actually the assets of a software enterprise. So you've got kind of two major assets. You've got your source code. The source code describes the sort of first party information that you're building into your applications. But then you also have any dependencies. So in fact, if you look at the software that you're delivering into your applications, it, it varies anywhere from sort of 50% software that you wrote to 10% software you wrote. And the rest of it, it can be even less, but the rest of it are dependencies. They can be dependencies on open source libraries, which is very common in this sphere, to dependencies on uh, commercial uh, attributes and uh, commercial packages that you've acquired. So the question in big enterprises is, where do we put those assets? How do we manage those? And what happens is, in big enterprises, they have to be very careful about what software they run in which environments. That means that you create very tight constraints over what packages can go where, and you end up building sort of bespoke systems for each kind of package. So I have my system for managing my Maven artifacts. I'll have a Maven repo that maybe mirrors uh, Maven Central, and then I'll have uh, another mirror for NPM. And what that does is that creates an, a management overhead. What that means is that every time somebody wants to take on a new tool or use a new CI system, they have to create a new way to manage those kinds of packages inside their enterprise with enforcing all of the policies around restricted access control, storage management, auditability, and all of that. That is a massive cost for teams that are, you're paying them to deliver software fast and to be innovative. That you don't want to block people who want to use some new language from doing that by you know, making them wait three months until you get the right infrastructure in place. So that's, that's the problem that we are trying to help solve. We do that through uh, a suite of tools. So the core thing that uh, I would say 
How many of you know Artifactory? But this is a very small audience, so it's not a very interesting question. Artifactory is kind of the core of the system. It's the repository manager platform. It sits on top of an infrastructure that does distributed access control across uh, very highly distributed organizations. So you can do hybrid cloud applications with common role-based access control on-prem and off-prem. X-Ray then provides you the ability to have deep insight into what are in your packages. Since this is most of your application that you're actually running in production, it's actually pretty interesting to know whether or not there's a vulnerability in a third-party library that you depend upon. No? You have a management plane on top of that that helps you configure this infrastructure for deploying and distributing applications across both on-prem and off-prem applications. And then Bintray is the piece that enables a CDN to act like a repository. So you can make a remote repo that's a Docker registry. And that's uh, what Bintray does. It layers that on top of a CDN so you have efficient distribution of binaries. So this, this fills in the gap from your source code control and, your and allows you to have flexibility for any automation tool to any deployment target. And here what we're going to look at is how we're deploying onto OpenShift as, as a Kubernetes cluster. <clears throat> so taking a step back, if we talk about the full software development lifecycle, Artifactory and JFrog products provide key values around the asset management for packages at many points of the software development life cycle. So you, know, you, you do your planning. We don't really have a role to play there and thinking about what it is you want to do. There's other tools for that. But when you're actually building your code, that's where those assets go. Then we, in the testing and release phases, we give you all the metadata you need to understand whether or not something's ready to promote from one stage to the next. And then in the distribution phase, we help you push those binaries to the endpoints where they need to be. So if you have remote data centers where you have to make sure the bits are close to the consumers, or IoT applications where you need to push things all the way out to the edge of the network and manage them as packages, Bintray provides that as a service. So that brings me to the notion of what is a Kubernetes registry. So OpenShift provides this really powerful tool for both doing application development and operations of applications on Kubernetes. It's a very powerful system. It doesn't help you know what all your third-party dependencies are. So a Kubernetes registry is the notion of using all of this powerful software that I just talked about, which allow you to do package management of all of the things that are contained in your application. So if you think about deploying an application to Kubernetes, you need three things. You need a Kubernetes cluster, you need a Docker registry, and you need some tooling for automated deployment of any updates to those applications to your Kubernetes cluster. The challenge is, if you don't know what's in those containers, you're exposing yourself. And as we talked about before, your containers actually contain a little bit of code that you wrote and a lot of code that somebody else wrote, whether they're open source projects or commercial packages that you depend upon. So when you use a tool like Artifactory, what you get is the ability to have traceability from all the way from your Docker containers all the way back to any dependencies you have on, say, the RPMs. So in Docker, we, we understand the deep structure of all of the layers in Docker. We can unpack those and identify the contained packages. And I'll show that to you. Uh, in just a minute. So the notion here is that you, know, you build base image, base layer images of the operating system components you depend upon. You bring in the third party components that you, you uh, depend upon, whether they're open source or commercial. And often, you know, if we were trying to stack these like in terms of the proportion of how much of your application they make up, usually this is by far the biggest amount of code right here. And then the little bit of code you, you do that provides your core value add as, a, as an enterprise or as an application developer, you're tying your dependencies together in your application code. And then you're taking all of that and putting it in a Docker image, putting that in a repository. Then you're deploying it to the, the Kubernetes cluster to operate it, to OpenShift. So what we do is we provide full traceability forward and back across all of the stacks. So now I'll show that to you. Uh, in a demo. So what I'm going to do is go over to OpenShift. Let's make sure I'm logged in still. 
So I have a very simple project here just to show the principles. So in this project, it's a, it's a stupid little Node.js app that shows our logo and the version right, of the package. Right, big deal. So that's, that's nice. Let's find out what's going on <clears throat> with that application today. So I'm going to go look at the builds for that application. I, I'm trying to ship software fast. Right? I want to make sure that I, I trust what's in there. So if I go in here, I notice that the last time this build ran, it failed. So if I take a look at the history of this, I can see that over time, is sometimes it succeeds and sometimes it fails. I mean, this is a demo system, so I know why it failed, but let's go find out why. Right? This particular last build failed. If we go take a look at the logs, what I'll see is that it, it uh, gave me an error here. It failed to fetch a dependency. So my Node.js application, so I have this CentOS Node.js app that I built, was trying to download, it looks like it's an NPM library called Ecstatic. So why did that fail? If I go take a look at that, I can see that it's actually trying to go, this artifact failed. It tried to download it from Artifactory. Artifactory said, hey, this was blocked based on a policy. So this policy is configured in X-Ray. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So if I go over to X-Ray, X-Ray, real quickly, this is the tool that actually provides me the deep package inspection so I can understand what's in, what's contained in, what are the hierarchical relationships between all of the contained packages in, in my environment. It's a, it's a service that you run on-prem or in the cloud that constantly updates with new vulnerabilities and new license information so you can understand what, what you're running and changes and issues in what you're running. So we're constantly streaming uh, new vulnerabilities from uh, known vulnerability sources, but I'm particularly interested in this component that I was just trying to build. So oh, let me log in. Hold on. So I was interested in the Node.js application, right? The one that I just uh, failed to build. So let's take a look in that. Don't tell me the internets are failing me here. Let's try that again. It seems like Wi-Fi might be failing us. I actually saw that happen for our poor friends before us from Microsoft Azure. So. Ah, fantastic. We have come back to life. So I, I looked for this component that I built, right? So this is the one that failed. Like, why was the build failing? I can actually get a full report of any issues that are in this, uh, this, this application. So this is actually the, the last time it successfully built. This is the security profile of that application. So I can see the contained relationship. I can see, for example, that I do have some major violations here. Well, let's find out what where those are. So uh, this node, this uh, headers uh, container actually has a number of different security issues in it. Maybe I shouldn't be using that. But I can actually see this is the impact analysis. I can understand where those issues are present across all the different layers of my application stack. So in this case, I can see that this NPM, oh, no, this is an RPM headers uh, dependency, is actually contained in multiple Docker layers, and I can see which Docker layers those are. So I can actually understand the impact of where this RPM dependency is reflected. But I'm interested in this case specifically about my ecstatic uh, issue. So let's go take a look at the watches here. So if I go look at my NPM watches, a watch is configured to allow me to not necessarily block everything that happens inside my organization. I want to set thresholds or policies about what's allowable, what, what's my sensitivity to risk, and what's my tolerance to risk. So in a watch, let's go take a look at the configuration of this watch. So we'll take a look at it. It's, I'm watching the Artifactory NPM remote. So in this case, this is a way I can govern what kinds of dependencies I'm bringing into my organization. So every time somebody uses the NPM registry, and it pulls in an external dependency, that causes this watch to be triggered. What does this watch actually do? This watch says, I have a severity filter. So anytime I find a major issue or greater in a new NPM uh, dependency, I'm going to do a block of the download. 
So I can do various different things. So the X-ray allows me to have very configurable policies. Under what conditions, for which types of artifacts, do I want to do which kinds of actions? So in this case, I've blocked the download, which is, helps me understand why I've had that issue. So if I go look at the violations here, I can see that ecstatic has been blocked, right? Because it is a major, if I'd used any of these other types, I could also have done that. So I can see, well, that's a DO, DDoS uh, kind of violation in NPM. And uh, so here I can see where that is, is contained. So now I have a deep understanding of why my application wouldn't build. So it's really very straightforward. I can just go do you know, best practice for software development. I'm going to go pull that violating dependency right out of my application. So let's just delete that sucker out. I'm going to go ahead and commit those changes directly to master, best practice for software development, right? So now that I've committed that, I can go back into OpenShift. Let's go look back at the, uh, let's go just do a rebuild now and see what happens. So I'm rebuilding it. Let's take a look at, uh, let's view this particular build and see what's happening. Let's take a look at the logs. Well, now I'm not downloading that ecstatic. So this is the OpenShift S2i. So we've actually built uh, our own uh, image that uses Artifactory as the Kubernetes registry for the OpenShift S2i build. So we're actually pulling all of our dependencies dynamically from endpoints in Artifactory. And then when we've succeeded with the build, we're actually going to push it back in uh, to Artifactory. Oh, we failed to fetch it. Did I not merge my change? Why did that fail? jQuery, save, maybe. Let's just try to run it again. Let's rebuild that sucker. Nope, failed to fetch it again. I'm not sure what's going on. Why do I still have a dependency? Maybe I'm changing the wrong. Oh, I know why. Because I'm changing my fork of, of his. No? No, no. I can't explain why right now. I'm not going to worry about it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a step back and say, look, Artifactory is this layer which allows me to abstract from my storage all the different package types which you depend upon. And you can then have a consistent way to manage both local and remote rep repositories for all of the different package types for which you depend on, upon uh, as an enterprise. And if you want to try this out, the best way to do that is to go to our website and get a free trial. So we enable you to use the product for 30 days. You can use it for our, all of your functionality. It's complete functionality. Uh, you can run it on any of the major clouds, AWS, Google, or Amazon. It works great with OpenShift. Um, we have a blog here where you can, sh you can actually, if you download it and you do self-manage, you can actually deploy it via OpenShift uh, scripts to, uh, to your OpenShift cluster. Uh, and uh, there's a nice uh, blog about that as well. So if you have any questions, uh, I will be here for those. So thank you very much.